What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I am your host, The Martian, also known as John, here to talk about this week's UFC card, the UFC 306 pay-per-view going down this Saturday night, headlined by Sean O'Malley defending his Bantamweight Championship against challenger Marab Davalashvili in a long-anticipated main event. Also, the trilogy between Alexa Grasso and Shevchenko going down in the co-main event for the flyweight belt, and an exciting fight card top to bottom a lot of mexicans on the card for obviously the the themed mexican card of uh rita season noche as they're calling it it is a uh, mexican themed mma event sponsored by saudi arabia with a headlining fight between an american and a georgian so we're all over the place here it's only 10 fights as opposed to the typical 12 13 fights the Biggest weight class in the card is 155 lightweight, so definitely an interesting, you know, event we got going on here. It's going to be at the Sphere. It's going to be really cool to see how the UFC, you know, presents everything with the Sphere, with the videos, and everything they have planned. Um, it's it's cool to see the UFC, you know, putting some effort towards an event. So many of these events are just, you know, the same stuff with just different fights, and now they're actually putting an effort to make like a custom event. And uh, it should it should pay off. I mean, the last time they, they did this last year, it was uh, a good event. They went to Mexico. It was a great event. And now they're doing this kind of a hybrid event here. So I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to see what's uh, on the docket. And uh, we're coming off a, a really good week of predictions, man. I think um, I just hit a lot of stuff on the head last week and predicted a lot of fights well. Um, Nathan Fletcher, Moneyline. Um, Andre Lima money line, Chris Padilla money line, Yanal Ashmu's money line, Sean Brady by decision, Natalia Silva by decision. Uh, I think I just predicted the majority of the fights really well last week and was able to give out some good winning bets as well. A few plus money money line winners and a few slight favorite winners as well. So, I mean, I think I'm very happy with how it went. I hope you all were able to uh, listen and uh, join in, get some, some winning wagers. And let's keep the ball rolling this week. We only got 10 fights. Do have to mention, though, I I, I do have a sore throat. I don't know if you could hear my voice is a little more uh, raspy than usual. So I'm going to have to take some breaks. And, you know, you might hear some cuts in the podcast. Instead of me doing the entire thing off the cuff, I'm going to have to, uh, you know, take some breaks and uh, take some swigs of water. So, um I, I apologize for that, but we're, we're trucking through. We only got 10 fights, so we're going to get uh, right into these fights with the first fight in the Bantamweight division. We got Raul Rosas Jr. taking on Alici Lang in the Bantamweight division. We have odds for this one. Minus 1,000 for Rosas with plus 700 coming back for Olichi Lang or Aori, um, whatever you want to call him. We're not going to have to call him anything much longer because this is probably going to be his last fight in the UFC. Another, you know, Chinese regional journeyman here. These guys are never any good. Um, he was able to pick up some wins in the UFC, but his luck is, is going to run out here. He's severely outmatched in this fight. And honestly, the line is probably fair. Honestly, I, I, Olichi Lang, his defensive grappling is not good. When he gets taken down, he gives up his back. And I just do not think that he's going to be able to stop the re- relentless grappling attack of Raul Rosas. And Rosas is young. He's steadily improving. His cardio failed him badly in the Sea Rod fight, but he still won the first round really easily. And that's what's going to happen here is Rosas is going to take him down at will until he either submits him or he severely gasses out. And if the latter happens, which I don't expect it to, you could always just live bet Aori if it looks like the tide is turning. But I think it's going to be a, a pretty easy takedown backpack rear naked choke for Raul Rosas here. Had a little bit of adversity in his last fight against Ricky Tercios, but was able to still prevail to get the sub in under one and a half rounds, by the way, in that fight. So um, I, I know some people, the only way they're probably looking to bet this fight is over or under one and a half rounds. And um, I would have to lean under, honestly, because. Uh, Aori gives up the back, and I just think Rosas is so relentless that it's going to probably get to that grappling and that back take pretty quickly here. And I think he could wrap up that choke at any time. So um, no official bet here, but I'm leaning a uh, 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 rear naked choke in under one and a half rounds. And that is going to move us to the flyweight division next. We have Edgar Chirez taking on Joshua Van. Odds for this one, Van minus 235, Chirez plus 200. 
Honestly, I think this betting line is pretty accurate with Van around 70%. He is coming back from that knockout loss to Charles Johnson pretty quickly here, but Charez not really a big hitter himself, and I think that that knockout was pretty unexpected. Obviously, Van, we've seen him strike with a lot of guys, and he's gotten you know dropped and hurt at times, but still, he was in control of that fight and just got caught with a huge punch and uh, got got fl floored there, but uh, it does concern me. He's coming back only about two or three months later, but this is a fairly forgiving matchup for, for doing that. Shirez is mostly looking to get the fight to the floor and get his submissions going where most of his wins have come by. But the guys he's submitting, a lot lower level than Joshua Van. And even though we've seen Van struggle with grappling at times way back in his uh, either pro debut or his second fight, he he struggled, got out grappled, and rear naked choked there. I think Shirez is just a much different type of grappler where a lot of his wins come by um, arm bar or guillotine. They're just not really like high percentage submissions that he's hitting on these guys. He's not the type of grappler to really take you down, control you, take the back, like methodically tap you out. He's more of like a transitional submission type of guy, and I, I don't think that that's going to work out for him here. I think that on the feet, Van should have a pretty good advantage and should be able to stifle all the takedown attempts and grappling attempts from Shirez. So where the line is at now, I, I do think it is accurate with, with Van at 70%. Um, always got to be looking for either Van round two, round three knockout because he has such good attritional body work and high volume and pressure that he puts on you as the fight goes. Or, of course, look to lie bet Josh Van because the guy is a bit of a slow starter. Takes a little bit to get going there. But even though I just said that about the rounds 2-3, I kind of think the goes the distance is being is generously priced here at minus 160. You know, they put a finish at maybe 38, 39%. I think it's actually a little lower than that. Um, you know, small chance of a, of a Van Kale late, small chance of, of a Shira submission in some form. But I really don't think it's happening. I think we're probably going to see... Uh, you know, a 30-27 or 29-28 decision for, for Josh Van here. You got to think Van's going to pr probably try to play it a little safer considering he did just get knocked out in a fight that he probably shouldn't have lost. So I think we'll see a good comeback decision win for Josh Van in that one. Next fight is in the women's strawweight division. Yasmin Haraguri taking on Ketlin Souza. Odds for this one, minus 500 Haraguri, plus 385 for Ketlin Souza. Kellen Souza is not a bad fighter, you know. She she has a, a lot of an experience in Invicta, and she even picked up, um, you know, her first UFC win in her last fight. Um, bad grappler, but that shouldn't even really come into play here. I think it's just going to be a striking fight where Yasmin is just pumping out more volume, landing better, and uh, I think she's got a little bit more power behind her punches, just a better technical striker, and I think Yasmin should pretty easily outstrike her on her way to a decision. Yasmin doesn't really push a super high pace. Um, I mean, in terms of finishing, like she pushes a solid pace, but I don't think she's going to like really turn it up into that third gear and really hunt the finish and chase it down. So I think it's going to be a pretty safe Haraguri decision here, which is obviously is indicated by the odds at uh, over 60% likely here for Haraguri. So not really too much to, to go off of in that one. Not really a good bettable fight. And we're going to be moving on to the lightweight division next. Manuel Torres, Ignacio Bahamundes. Odds for this one, Torres minus 130, Bahamundes plus 110. This odds, uh, the odds actually flipped on this one from where the line opened up. Um, Torres was plus money for, you know, almost a month, a few weeks before the fight. And now we're seeing more money pour in on Torres and him settle as a small favorite, which I actually agree with here. I actually took some of that Torres money line at plus 114 uh, a couple weeks back. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been wrong about Manuel Torres uh, several times throughout his career so far. But I have to accept the fact that this guy is pretty good. He's dangerous. He's very lethal in the first round. He really hasn't been out of round one very much. I believe only one time. And that was a split decision win uh, over six years ago. So... I was just heavily relying too much on him not being out of the first round, and I kind of, you know, wrongly assumed that would make him a, a big liability, but it hasn't come to fruition so far. He's been killing guys left and right in the UFC, most uh, knockout of the year contender last year, and the way he just ran through Chris Duncan on the mat and just easily took him down and submitted him uh, was really impressive as well, so... 
Torres is lethal, man, especially in the first round. And for a guy who's so dangerous at finishing on the feet and on the floor in the first round, I just don't see why you'd want to bet against him before the fight. Sure, Baja Mendez has uh, potential to come back here and take over in the second and third rounds with his cardio and his experience advantage, but I imagine he's going to be going through a pretty hellacious first round to make it there. So I like Torres at plus money before the fight. And, um, you know, who really knows how the guy's cardio is going to look? You got to lean towards it not being good, considering he hasn't been tested in so long. But his only two losses are some weak, you know, grappling submission losses um, five or six years ago. And it seems like he's been working on his grappling a lot since then as well. So, uh, I don't know. It's tough to see where Baja Mendes has a clear advantage here other than experience and, and late round experience uh, recently. But, uh, I mean, Torres is a hard hitter on the feet. Uh, he's a bit defensively void, but Baja Mendes is not a hard hitter himself. And I think Baja Mendes is going to be a live bet round two, round three, or pass situation here. I think he's going to struggle on round one, might even get finished. So uh, I wouldn't knock any stabs on Baja Mendes 2-3 props, especially sub 2-3, because we do uh, we have seen him get that, that late sub uh, in uh, the one fight against Zhu Rong. Um, but Bachman, this is competition. The UFC has been pretty lackluster, man. And the guys he's fought that have been a little better, um, were able to, were able to defeat him. And, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just done doubting Manuel Torres for the time being. I'm hopping on the train. Uh, I might've got, got I might've jumped in on the wrong station, but, uh, we'll find out. And I'm happy to have him a plus money going into this fight this weekend and uh, just be aware for uh, the Bahamandas live bet if it looks like Torres is struggling or is going to gas out I think you'll be able to jump in at a better price in the live window that's going to move us on to the last fight in the prelims women's bantamweight fight Irina Aldana Norma Dumont a near pick em fight here with Aldana as a slight favorite right now minus 113 Dumont minus 107 two-way action type of fight here people are betting both sides i believe aldana got some early week action and now we're seeing some norma buyback and it's a justified kind of pick and fight i mean it's a it's a pretty classic striker versus grappler fight here sometimes that's that term is thrown around loosely but i really think it's accurate here because when the fight's on the feet it's very clear aldana's going to have a significant advantage um just a much better striker she's uh, more durable she wears strikes better we saw her just get her leg destroyed in that last fight versus carol hosa and it didn't really phase her she just kept coming on uh, she showed incredible resolve and cardio and, and determination in that fight and you know i think she got kicked in the legs over 100 times in that fight that might be like the most leg kicks ever landed in a single fight and it didn't uh, Irina Aldana didn't give a fuck she kept marching forward and was able to uh, you know box carol Hosa's ears off in the second and third round she got her leg kicked 95 times in that fight so um she's just nasty she she throws a ton of strikes man she landed uh 30 in the first round 54 in the second 61 in the third so when this fight's on the feet you just know that Irina Aldana is going to be throwing more strikes landing harder she's the better technical striker of the two uh, but she's also not a good grappler she can be taken down she can be stuck on her back we've seen her lose fights like that time and time again and that's where Norman Dumont's advantage is in this fight, is on the ground, which she has done to win some of her most recent fights, especially the Jermaine Duranime fight. Um, that was a fight where she was outmatched in the feet. She struggled when it was on the feet. But when she got her takedown, she was able to very safely win. Dumont doesn't do a whole lot on top. When she takes you down, she is looking to hold that top position. She is not looking to... Um, to pass guard she's not looking to land ground and pound she is looking to hold position win rounds and win fights which is a pretty good strategy because we see a lot of fighters especially women just very sloppy top position they lose position they end up on bottom they just make a ton of bonehead mistakes um, so norma doesn't do a whole lot but that's actually somewhat of a smart strategy so the way i see it though is which woman is going to have a bigger margin of victory when they have the fight in their preferred realm, which is striking for Aldana, ground for Dumont. Um, to me, it's Irina Aldana because of damage. Damage is supposed to be the number one scoring criteria. Irina Aldana is the Mexican fighter. The crowd's going to be cheering for her. I mean, um, I think she's going to land the better strikes in the feet. And even when she's on bottom, I think she's going to be, you know, throwing strikes. And I think she's a little bit, or I, I'm pretty sure she's much better than Tremaine Duranime on bottom. And we'll be able to work her way up a little bit better. 
And even if she gets taken down at times in rounds, if she can hustle back up to her feet, land a few strikes, the crowd goes crazy, the judges um, score the fight in the round in her favor, I think that's very possible. Um, so I like uh, Aldana here in terms of uh, damage. I just think she's the much more damaging fighter. And um, I'm not really just concerned about Numa Norma's top game. If she gets her takedowns, what's the worst that's going to happen? She gets laid on? Well, I'm fine with that. While Aldana has you know power, she's actually knocked several women out on the feet. Um, so I got Aldana here. I think her money line is good. I think her inside the distance line is solid at plus 550. And then uh, her no scorecards line as well is still available, minus 136 um, on, on FanDuel. That's a popular bet here. That puts her chances of a finish at, you know, below 6 out of 10 finishes. But with how inactive uh, Norma is on top, I have a hard, hard time seeing her um, win this fight by finish. In the UFC, she has seven wins, all seven are by decision. She really hasn't even been close. She hasn't even attempted a submission in her UFC run, despite a lot of top time, a lot of takedowns. So I'm not too worried about Norma's top game here. I think the damage is significantly in favor of Aldana, and that's why I'll be betting and uh, rocking with her here. And that's going to take us to the main card. Personally, I like this main card. I think some people out there have been criticizing it, um, which isn't completely um, wrong to do because the first four fighters, the first two fights, are all kind of unknown guys. Um, O'Day's been in the UFC for a long time, but he's a nobody. Rolando has only had one fight in the UFC. Ribovix has only been in the UFC for about a year, but he's really exciting. Zell Huber is really exciting. So I think these fights will produce, honestly. I think that um, Rolando brings a big tempo, and he's going to make that fight exciting. And then Zell Huber Ribovix is going to be a really exciting striking fight between two young, promising guys. So I don't think there's a really valid criticism of these two fights on the main card. Maybe the only thing I would say is you could put Rolando and Osborne on the prelims and then bump Aldana Norma up because, I mean, they are top 10 women after all. But, um, you know, I, I don't think it's a totally bad idea to keep the women off the main card in, in its entirety. So um, I like these fights, though. The first one, flyweight division, Rolando, Rodriguez, O'Day, Osborne. Odds for this one have um, Rodriguez minus 145, Osborne coming back plus 125. You'll see people call him Luis or Rolando. It's all good. And then he has a cool nickname as well. What is it? It's like El Toro. <laughs> Lazy boy. <laughs> well, El Toro. Um, I think that's Manuel Torres. Uh, El Loco. Close enough. Got to work on the Espanol. Lo siento. Anyway, um, Rolando, fun debut, man. I mean, this guy, he's an aggressive fighter. He's athletic. He seems like a guy who isn't the best skill wise, but at 125, man, you got to be an athlete. You got to have some explosive power. You got to be durable. You got to have good cardio. And I think he does have those things. While O'Day, I think he's probably the more clean fighter of the two, but I kind of think the guy lacks the hardware, man. He he falls apart there at times. He's he's gotten finished, I think, three or maybe even four times in the UFC so far. Um, yeah, four four finishes, two knockouts, two subs. Uh, oh no, five five finish. Oh, excuse me, five finished losses. That's crazy, dude. That is crazy. Um, that's bad. <laughs> I always remember his debut against uh, Kelleher. He was on like the the McGregor card. He was talking some crazy shit before the fight about how he's gonna like be like well a household name, and then he just tapped out to like the weakest guillotine ever. Um, so. Um, O'Day, I think he's, I think P, I understand why people are, are thinking he's going to win this fight. Orlando Rodriguez, his most uh, relevant loss is the Jerome Rivera fight, who is uh, not a good fighter, but he's a big southpaw striker who is able to use his lateral movement and kind of uh, avoid the rushes of, of Lazy Boy and outstrike him. And I think people are looking like, oh, Jerome Rivera sucks. He went in the UFC. He went 1-4, 0-4, and four, oh and four actually. Um, and he got finished in his three losses. Oh, if he beat uh, Rodriguez, Rodriguez must stink, and O'Day should outstrike him. But, I mean, the guy is 12-7, and seven, guys. Uh, O'Day Osborne finished five times in the UFC, seven losses. He's clearly not, like, up to the test of, of beating difficult matchups. So... I have no faith in him here. I think he could outstrike Lazy Boy and give him some issues early, but I think Lazy Boy is just going to track him down and eventually put a, put a bead on him in the second or third round, possibly even finishing him. I know some people like the round two, round three sub props, which did hit for Rodriguez in his last fight. 
and I think have a, a decent chance of coming home here because we've seen uh, O'Day sub before. He just wilts in there, man. He 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 gives up on himself. And um, I think that those intangibles, the, that durability and the aggression of Rodriguez are going to take over here. And honestly, before the fight, I, I don't even knock a play on Rodriguez. I think under 2-1 to one is fine. But I think I'll be waiting on the live bet. Um, you know, hopefully O'Day has that early success I was talking about with his strikes and his movement while O'Day is fresh. And then once O'Day starts slowing down and the second and third gets taken down a few times, I think that's when we start to see Rodriguez take over and possibly get that finish. So I like the two, three stabs for Rodriguez. And I like looking for a live bet on, uh, on lazy boy Rodriguez here in a fun opening fight between two unknown guys. But I mean, I think that the UFC knows what they're doing here, and I think they're setting Rolando up for a fun fight, uh, a fun finish in the first fight. The next fight is in the lightweight division where we have Daniel Zellhuber taking on Esteban Ribovics. Odds for this one have Zellhuber as the minus 220 favor, Ribovics coming back plus 185. I mentioned this earlier, but man, I think this one is going to be good. And I mean, both of these guys are young, exciting strikers. Um, they both have just solid striking styles i really like both of the way uh both of the ways these guys fight um pretty boxing centric but they also have good kicks and um yeah and they both had that one you know lackluster performance ribovics debut against loic um where i actually I, I think i was actually more impressed with him in that fight despite him losing and I honestly think that Ribovix has a pretty bright future ahead of him. Um, while Loic, you know, we kind of know what kind of fighter he is at this point. Zell Hooper had that one, you know, bad performance against Ogden where just kind of a head scratching performance. No idea what happened there, but has bounced back pretty well. It's hard to imagine these guys just not being in a really competitive striking fight. We saw Zell Hooper struggle with the forward pressure and the volume of, of uh, Prado. Even Lando Venata gave him some close rounds at times. Uh, Christos Yagos won the first round off of him. So he's uh, Lucas Almeida and him went to war, and that was got a 29-28 decision. So I don't think Zell Hooper is a very fast starter, and I don't think he's a guy who's just going to dominate this fight on the feet. While Ribovic's a, a skill striker, I think he starts pretty fast. He's tenacious. He's aggressive. He can string together combinations really well. He doesn't have a ton of late fight experience. He has a few round three finishes, only been to the decision twice, and that was both in the UFC in the past year and a half. Um, but I think his cardio is solid for, for a guy who hasn't been that late in fights. Um, Kirk took him down and took uh, held him down in the first round. Ribovic put a pace on him in the second and third. And Loic was taking him down all fight long. It didn't matter. Ribovic kept getting up, kept chasing at him, dropped him with a combination of punches in the third round. So I think Ribovix is just going to keep on coming, man. And I really, I'm leaning towards this fight being a finish. I, I just think I don't see much grappling going on with these guys here. I, I would be a little surprised to see either guy shoot or hit a takedown here. And then that means it's just going to strike and they're both, you know, solid strikers. I think they're both a little bit there to be hit and you know, the fight ending inside the distance at plus 140 is staring at me. And, um, you know, that's what I'll, I, I think the money line side is Ribovix. I think Zell Huber's slight favorite makes sense. Maybe minus 150 and 170 where it's at now, I do think is wide. So I think a, a bet on Ribovix is warranted and I have a feeling this one ends inside the distance. So I'll, I'll stamp that bet. Um, I've always said it whenever I, I have a bad track record with betting inside the distance fights, but I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with it here. I, I, I just don't think these guys are going to be killing clock, right? We see a lot of fights where you're like, oh, they're clinching. Good. Nothing's going to happen. Oh, a takedown happens. Okay. We know there's not going to be a finish. I don't see that happening here, guys. I think it's going to be like a competitive fight and they're all, they're going to be hitting each other hard the entire time. And I think a finish could happen at any moment. So, um, I like Ribovix and the ITD there. We are moving on to the featherweight division. Brian Ortega, Diego Lopes, a fight that was supposed to happen a few months back. Uh, Lopes is minus 200. Ortega is plus 170. So that Lopes fight against Ige, I think it was a pretty bad look for Lopes, man. I think that he had a, a few you know, quick finishes in a row. And when we finally got to see him in an extended fight, we were reminded that he's not as good of a fighter as we were led to believe after some of those finishes. Danny Gay is a pretty uniquely uh, tough matchup, I think, for him. Uh, he was able to win the first and second round pretty easily with, um, excuse me, a uh, 
maybe a Doris or Anaconda choke at the end of the first round. He got a takedown in the back take in the second round, but then looked pretty tired in the third round. He was getting outboxed. He got put on bottom in the last minute of the fight. So I think Lopes is a guy who's going to really struggle in five-round fights. And I just don't think the guy is, is super functional. And that's kind of Brian Ortega's style as well. Definitely not like a, a functional fighter who wins fights in a very safe and methodical way. But, um, I mean, Brian Ortega is proven in those those wild brawling type of fights where he loses early and he comes back. Or he finds an opportunistic sub in a fight he was losing. Diego Lopes, I don't I don't know if he's cut from that same cloth. I know he had a lot of sub attempts in the most of Loya fight. But I think, like... Once Lopes starts, you know, fading a little bit, I, I think he's he has a little bit more of like the, the surrender in him than Brian Ortega. Brian Ortega, you know, rolled his ankle in the Yair fight, got got beat up in the first round, didn't matter. T- second and third round, he absolutely dominated and finished that fight in the third round for his patented third round sub. And when you see Lopes slowing down in the third round, um, you know, getting stuck on bottom in the third round versus Ige, I don't know how minus 200 could look appealing to you against Brian Ortega, who is the king of the comeback round three sub. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm I'm Ortega or a pass here. I, I I can't get behind that confidence in Lopes. I would say maybe slight favorite minus 130, 150 for Lopes is fine because um, he's much more active. He has a higher ceiling at this point. Ortega, you know, saw pictures of him this week. He doesn't look in great shape. He didn't look in great shape last fight where he he pulled out of that one um after after did he make weight or did he miss weight i think he missed weight um let me go back and double check for that one um but that was just a concerning fight week all top to bottom right um no he he made weight oh it was lightweight they moved it to lightweight right yeah so concerning stuff on ortega's end um but i still gotta go with him at, at 170 um I'm not going to endorse an Ortega as a bet, but I do think he will be uh, obviously a good live bet. Um, he's always a slow starter. I think Lopes, you know, is going to have his his big early moment, either a takedown or a big punch that lands, or a knee or something that lands in the first round. I think Lopes is definitely more likely to start quicker, but you can never count Brian Ortega out. And I don't think that Lopes is finishing him. I think. Um, if Lopes win, it'll be a decision, while if Ortega wins, it'll probably be a finish in the, in the second or third. So um, let's see what uh, Ortega 2, 1,000, Ortega 3, 1,400, those are good. And, of course, once again, that live bet on Brian Ortega. Brian Ortega sub is at 750, bro. Come on. Round 3 sub for Ortega is like a must bet at this point, point. Um, and it's 30 to 1. So I'll be on those for show. And that's going to do it for that fight. We're moving on to the title fights. We have the trilogy for the Women's Strawweight Championship. Alexa Grasso, the champion, taking on former champ Valentina Shevchenko. Odds for this one have Grasso minus 139, Shevchenko plus 119. Um, Unfortunately, we have to see this fight for a third time in a row. I mean, last fight was close, right? Obviously, it was a very clear fight. First and third round to Shevchenko. Second and fifth round to Grasso. The fourth round was the toss-up round. It was a round that could have gone either way. When I watched the fight today, I thought Shevchenko won it, but <clears throat> it could go either way. You know, it was just clearly a split decision. But the fact that, that one dumbass judge made it a 10-8 round in the fifth round, which nobody in the universe agreed with, leads us to seeing this fight for a third time. I think it's justified that we have to see it for a third time because that dumbass judge made it a, a 10-8. And if, if he gives that 10-9 a Grasso, it's a split decision for Shevchenko and we all move on. Instead, we got to watch the trilogy, um, but these women do seem fairly evenly matched. I think that Grasso clearly has the you know the bigger moment upside of the two. She she hurt Grasso with a punch in the in the second fight. She had the choke obviously in the first fight. She had that big moment in the fifth round with a back take. So it seems like. Although I should say, Shevchenko also did have a good uh, mounted guillotine in the third round of the second fight too. So. Um, it seems like the more, uh, as we, we often say, minute winner, round winner is Shevchenko. Uh, but Grasso has that more big moment, that finish upside, I guess you could say. But rewatching these fights, um, I think the, the disparity in grappling is bigger in favor for Shevchenko than the striking disparity is for Grasso. I mean, I thought the striking was actually really even in that second fight. Shevchenko's jab was working really well. She had a few nice body kicks. And... I don't know, man. I think that Shevchenko is still the better fighter, but 
what we saw with Moreno and Fig is the first fight, Fig was clearly better. And then, you know, as that weight cut got tougher for Fig, as he had more miles on him, all of a sudden we start to see Moreno take over the fight. Still, you know, the more they went, um, Fig won the first and the third. Moreno won the second and the fourth. But when Moreno won, he won by finish. While when Fig won, he won by somewhat narrow decision. And I, I get those vibes a little here, you know, Grasso less miles on her, the younger fighter, you got to think the fight, you know, being rebooked favors her. Uh, but at, at this current line, man, I can't get behind it. I mean, we're going from minus 700 to Shevchenko in the first fight, which was wrong um, to Shevchenko, you know, 65% minus 190 in the second fight. I think that's kind of accurate. And then now I guess you could maybe take off a little bit, but I still have to favor Shevchenko, man. The takedowns came too easy. Alexa Grasso, full guard on her back, very poor attempts to get back up to her feet. The striking was competitive. Shevchenko's jab looked good. And you know, Shevchenko is more experienced. I think she's the better fighter. And I think that, um, you know, I haven't seen, you know, major signs of her slowing down. Um, and I'm going to go with her t- to finally put a, a win on, on this fight here. It's the third time. I think she's going to win it. I think it'll be by decision. I think it'll be a, a good amount of wrestling and her getting on top of her. And um, I'm going with Chev here, man. I think it's a little bit of an unpopular pick. Obviously, the market is moving in Grasso's direction at, uh, when the near pick and price was available. Uh, I think it's gone too far. I think they're disrespecting Chev a little bit here, and uh, I'll be going with her. Haven't locked in a bet yet myself because it seems like the odds are just keep moving in favor of Grasso. So let's wait to see how far this blows out, and then I'm interested in Shevchenko, and I'll pick her to win the fight by decision. The main event in the Bantamweight division, we have champion Sean O'Malley taking on Marab Davalashvili, a longtime perennial contender, finally getting his title shot. And the odds have this one competitive. It was a near pick at times. Now we are seeing the money come in on O'Malley, pushing him to a minus 132 favorite. Marab coming back at plus 112 on the dog side here. And man, I can't wait for this one. Honestly, I would reckon that I'm down a good amount of money both betting both of these guys in my lifetime, which is kind of strange because they've been the same fighter for a long time. And I've just done a pretty poor job assessing their fights, uh, honestly. So it's going to be interesting to see how it matches up here. I will say, not exactly a hot take. I did predict both of their last fights correctly, but those are kind of obvious outcomes that happened there. Um, so I'm on a little bit of a come up here, but um, I'm picking Sean to win the fight. I, I am. I'll, I'll get get that out of the way. I have not placed any wagers on the fight. I don't. I do not know what is the the most valuable wager on this one. Some fights, I think there's a clear bet. Some not so much. Um, you know, in this one. I don't know. I really don't have a bet that I'm gonna I'm gonna stamp. The one thing I'll say that I that I my more confident take on this fight is that I think a lot of people think that this fight is oh O'Malley knocks him out in the first or second, or Marab takes over and drowns him with his pressure and his pace and his activity and either takes over for a three four five finish, or wins a a lopsided decision. I don't think that's the the dynamic of the fight, man. I really don't. I think that that's possible. Both of the, the both of those outcomes are possible, but I think people are underrating that this could be a competitive decision where Marab gets his game going, or he's taking him down, he's pushing him against the cage, he's control not really controlling him much. And then they get back the distance at times. O'Malley lands the better strikes, and then the rounds are somewhat competitive. But if that happens. You got to go with O'Malley, in my opinion, because damage is the the bigger factor. And the more accurate striker, the more damaging striker, the more precise striker is Sean O'Malley. And he's proven that time and time again. And I mean, this guy has gotten a lot, a lot better. I never, never in a million years would have thought that he beat Peter Yan, even though he did it by extremely close decision. I didn't even think Sean was going to be able to get the fight close enough to to make it that close of a decision. And I firmly stand by the fact that the Peter Jan won that fight. But the first and third rounds are competitive. You know, um, you could go O'Malley in those rounds. And then, you know, the knockout of Aljo Sterling, man, incredible. Never thought that would happen. I thought Aljo minus 250 was accurate. And even when the fight was happening, I was like, oh, you know, Sean O'Malley's in, or uh, excuse me, uh, Aljo's in control. He's doing his thing. Boom, knockout happens. So Sean O'Malley is a lot, a lot better than I thought. And um, I think he's proven that he's better in a lot of areas while 
Marab is kind of the same fighter he was years and years back. He's better at everything he does, but it's not like we've seen a big evolution in, in Marab's game. Um, he's always been the, the come forward, put up a ton of strikes, put up a ton of takedowns, incredible cardio, incredible durability. But... Um, you know, I think this is a uniquely tough matchup. So Marab is obviously going to take him down. Obviously, uh, O'Malley's takedown defense can be can pe penetrated, and I think Marab's going to take him down time and time again. But Marab's top top game stinks. He doesn't keep you down. He doesn't really do a whole lot of damage. He's not a sub threat at all. So I just don't see why, why O'Malley has to be that discouraged. Like if he gets taken down, O'Malley's thinking, "Oh, I knew this was coming. I'm going to get back up and I'm going to land some hands on him." Um, and I just think that there's there's too much distance striking allowed for me to like Marab's chances here. Even in the the Yan fight, the, the Suhudo fight, fights that he won very clearly, those guys had a lot of distance striking exchanges. And Suhudo looked pathetic in that fight. He did rock him in the first round to win the first round. It's the same type of, of uh, punch that, that Marlon Marais landed, uh, the left hook in, in an exchange that dropped him in the first round of that fight. O'Malley's not really a big left hook kind of guy. He's much more right hand dominant for his power punches, but um, still, that's a strike we know that he's susceptible to. And um, and Peter Yan, you know, I think his striking style was just uniquely poor for Murad because he kind of he lets you come forward and he's a counter striker at times, but he just couldn't ever get the timing on Murad, and he just got drowned by Murad's pace before Yan could get comfortable. And by the time the second round came, where Yan is usually taking over, he was so overwhelmed that he was you know mentally beaten at that point. And I gotta say, Murad's performance in that fight was absolutely incredible, and. If he wins this fight here, it's going to be a similar thing where he shoots fucking 20, 30 takedowns. He puts up, you know, two, 300 uh, strike attempts and he just goes at that 25 minute cardio and puts Sean through the ringer. That's possible here, but man, I really think this is going to be a, a different fight than people expect. And it's going to be a fight that is has five somewhat competitive rounds, but I think Sean is clearly going to do the more damage in three of them and win the fight that way. Um... You know, I'm going against the grain here. I think I laid out, you know, how I think most people are thinking about the fight early on with that early Sean KO, Marab taking over. Obviously, that is very possible. But I think we're actually going to see a Sean O'Malley decision here. And I'm sure that that is, uh, you know, one of the lesser anticipated outcomes in terms of the odds. Odds have it at four to one. It's, um, you know, the third most likely outcome behind, uh, you know, O'Malley ITD is, I believe, um, O'Malley ITD most likely, then Marab decision, then Mali decision, then Marab ITD. Um, even though I'm saying that, I will be also stabbing Marab around four, round five knockout props because he, he doesn't really go for subs. And if he drowns O'Malley with his pressure, like we, you know, is definitely possible here. I think he could get, you know, an exhaustion TKO finish or something. 40 to one for round four, 45 to one for round five. I like those props for sure. But I think we're finally going to see Marab's, you know, reckless pressure and his bad defense finally get punished here by um, an accurate puncher in Sean O'Malley. And uh, O'Malley's going to do it, man. I think he's going to win the fight. I'll go with an official prediction of a 49-46 decision for O'Malley. And every time Marab gets hurt, I think he's going to, you know, crash in, go for some clinch, go for some takedowns. He's not going to score much. And then boom, they get back to distance. O'Malley does more damage, wins the rounds. And that's going to be my pick. No official bet on the main event. And not a lot of uh, bets. I'm, I'm fully stamping on this one, honestly. It's a lighter week for me. I took Tor as a plus money. That's no longer available. The best bet, I believe, at current prices I would go with is Irina, Irina Aldana money line. I also mentioned I like her no score cards, her ITD line. I think Luis Rodriguez is getting it done. I like his round two, round three props. I think Ribovix is good, along with the inside the distance in the Ribovix fight. Um, Brian Ortega, submission in the second and third. Valentina Shevchenko, money line. And uh, that is going to do it. That is going to do it. Um, like I said, not a ton of, of confident bets this week, but the one I'm stamping the most confident, I like Irina Aldana, money line at a near pick and price. So that is going to do it. Hope you all enjoy the fights this week. Um, thanks for tuning in, even though, uh, you know, a little bit of a raspy voice this week. And uh, hope you all enjoyed the podcast. Got some good information. Hope you all enjoyed the, the fun event we have at the Sphere coming up and win some bets. And I'll see you all before the next UFC event. Peace out, everyone. Thank you.